Yes, thank you guys. Um, and what a great opportunity, not only to build <clears throat> relationships, but to serve and care for those in our, for, from the international community here right in our hometown. So I do encourage you to look into that opportunity. Uh, we are continuing our series in the book of Daniel. So we are in Daniel chapter 5 this morning. Um, so if you would turn there, if you have your Bibles, I encourage you to turn there. It'll also be up here on the screen, or you can follow along on your devices. And while you're turning there, uh, I'll, I'll say, you know, if you're, if you're newer, you've probably, you've seen Jay and myself up here preaching over the last five weeks or so. Um, we also have another pastor. Uh, his name is Chipper. He's our lead pastor, actually. And uh, you may have noticed that in the bulletin and been like, where is this Chipper guy? Um, he is on sabbatical this summer, which is a wonderful blessing. It's a rhythm that we do for all of our pastors every five years as a way to reflect on ministry from the last five years, to have time of rest and uh, study and to attend to things that you don't normally get to work on in your regular rhythms, right? And then also to look ahead and plan for the coming five years. So he's about halfway through that. He'll be back mid-July. So be praying for the Flanagan family as they're away. And then Jay is also up in Washington, D.C. Um, with the family, getting some rest this weekend. So pray for them, safe travels. And thank you to Eric and the whole team for uh, leading us in worship this morning. Okay, Daniel 5. If you wouldn't mind standing to honor the reading of God's word, that would be wonderful. Beginning in verse 1. King Belshazzar made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in front of the thousand. Belshazzar, when he tasted the wine, commanded that the vessels of gold and of silver that Nebuchadnezzar his father had taken out of the temple in Jerusalem be brought, that the king and his lords, his wives, and his concubines might drink from them. Then they brought in the golden vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God in Jerusalem. And the king and his lords, his wives, and his concubines drank from them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Immediately, the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace opposite the lampstand. The king saw the hand as it wrote. Then the king's color changed and his thoughts alarmed him. His limbs gave way and his knees knocked together. The king called loudly to bring in the enchanters, the Chaldeans, and the astrologers. <clears throat> the king declared to the wise men of Babylon, Whoever reads this writing and shows me its interpretation shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around his neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Then all the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the writing or make known to the king the interpretation. Then King Belshazzar was greatly alarmed, and his color changed, and his lords were perplexed. The queen, because of the words of the king and his lords, came into the banqueting hall, and the queen declared, O king, live forever. Let not your thoughts alarm you or your color change. There is a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. In the days of your father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of, of the gods, were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, made him chief of the magicians, enchanters, Chaldeans, and astrologers, because an excellent spirit, knowledge, and understanding to interpret dreams, explain riddles, and solve problems were found in this Daniel, whom the king named Belshazzar. Belteshazzar, excuse me. Now let Daniel be called, and he will show the interpretation. Then Daniel was brought in before the king. The king answered and said to Daniel, You are that Daniel one of the exiles of Judah, whom the king, my father, brought from Judah. I have heard of you, that the spirit of the gods is in you, and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom are found in you. Now the wise men, the enchanters, have been brought in before me to read this writing and make known to me its interpretation, but they could not show the interpretation of the matter. But I have heard that you can give interpretations and solve problems. Now, if you can read the writing and make known to me its interpretation, you shall be clothed with purple, have a chain of gold around your neck, and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. And Daniel answered, said before the king, Let your gifts be for yourself, and give your rewards to another. 
Nevertheless, I will read the writing to the king and make known to him the interpretation. O king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar your father kingship and greatness and glory and majesty. And because of the greatness that he gave him, all peoples, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him. Whom he would, he killed, and whom he would, he kept alive. Whom he would, he raised up, and whom he would, he humbled. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened, so that he dealt proudly, he was brought down from his kingly throne, and his glory was taken from him. He was driven from among the children of mankind, and his mind was made like that of a beast, and his dwelling was with the wild donkeys. He was fed grass like an ox, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, until he knew that the Most High God rules the kingdom of mankind and sets over it whom he will. And you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, though you knew all this, but you have lifted up yourself against the Lord of heaven. And the vessels of his house have been brought in before you, and you and your lords, your wives, and your concubines have drunk wine from them. You have praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which do not see or hear or know, but the God in whose hand is your breath, and whose are all your ways, you have not honored. Then from his presence the hand was sent, and this writing was inscribed. And this is the writing that was inscribed, Mene, Mene, Tekel, and Parson. And this is the interpretation of the matter. Mene, God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Then Belshazzar gave the command, and Daniel was clothed with purple, a chain of gold was put around his neck, and a proclamation was made about him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. And that very night, Belshazzar the Chaldean king was killed, and Darius the Mede received his kingdom, being about 62 years old. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray together. Father of heaven, thank you that we can gather together and hear your word, this word that happened thousands of years ago. Lord, that we get to sit here now and hear of your work and take it to heart. So I pray, Lord, that as we work through another challenging passage this morning, God, that you would meet us, that you would be here in our midst, that you would bring conviction where that is needed, and Lord, that you would bring peace and joy all the more. We pray that your Holy Spirit would open our eyes to see and our hearts to trust you and that Christ would be lifted up in this time. We pray in his name. Amen. You can be seated. <clears throat> well, A.W. Tozer, the uh, early to mid-20th century uh, pastor and author, opened his book, A Knowledge of the Holy, with these iconic words. He said, What comes into our minds when we think about God <clears throat> is the most important thing about us. It's the most important thing about us <clears throat> because it is the most foundational thing about us. What we think about God will direct how we live, what we value, what we prioritize, what we trust, how we treat others. But also what we think about God will determine how we relate to him. If we see God as, as harsh or uncaring, we may struggle to trust him. If we see God as, as distant or unconcerned, we may find it difficult to know him or to sense his presence. But if those false notions of God are stripped away, and instead we, we get a picture of who God truly is, then we experience what our souls are made for, an encounter with our creator. And along with that, we experience 
the life that is truly life. So in this series, in the book of Daniel, we are exploring how seeing God more clearly for who he is, for, for what he is like, for what he, what he does and how he acts, cultivates in us a resilient faith that equips us to live in a challenging and confusing world. And so far in this series, we've reflected on various attributes of God, his faithfulness, his wisdom, his greatness, his, his worthiness, and last week we looked at his sovereignty. And this week in Daniel 5, we see another attribute of God, and that is the holiness of God. We see that God is holy. And as we reflect on that in this passage, uh, I want to look at that in two parts to reflect on what it means that God is holy, but then also how we are to live as his holy people, what it means for us to live as the people of a holy God. So first, a holy God. And a little bit of context here, a fair amount of time has passed between the events of chapter 4 and chapter 5. So you remember last week we looked at Nebuchadnezzar and his, his humbling after his, his pride uh, and how God restored him. Well, Nebuchadnezzar died in 562 B.C. Then his son took over as king but was assassinated by his brother-in-law, quite a family. Uh, and his brother-in-law was in on the throne for around four years and then was succeeded by his son, uh, who was then dispatched rather quickly by some conspirators, after which uh, Nabonidus became the new ruler of Babylon, and he reigned from 556 to 539 BC when Babylon finally fell to the Persians. However, uh, Nabonidus spent most of the last 10 years or so of his rule in an Arabian desert, and we aren't exactly sure why. It was either by choice on a campaign or by force he was relocated because of some unpopular opinions that he had. Either way, uh, it was his son that was appointed as a co-regent or the co-ruler of Babylon during those 10 years, and his son's name was Belshazzar. And that's who we're introduced to here in this chapter. So altogether, around at least 25 years or so have passed between these two chapters. And now we have a new king of Babylon, Belshazzar. He would be Babylon's last. And in fact, the events that are recorded in this chapter are the events of his last night alive. And they sound sort of like something from a Brandon Sanderson novel. I don't know if you follow that. It's eerily similar. Maybe we are finding his source material here. So uh, Belshazzar is throwing a feast alongside a thousand of his lords. (coughs) And during this party, they do something so offensive, so outrageous, that God hand delivers a message to them. And yes, that was a pun, despite the groans. I put that in there. <clears throat> uh, a hand appears that writes four words on the wall, and it absolutely terrifies Belshazzar. His color changed, his knees knocked together. It says his ligaments were loosed, which probably means he had a little bit of an accident. And then we hear a familiar refrain. He summons his council of experts to interpret the revelation, but surprise, surprise, they are unable to do it. Once again, now for the third or fourth time in this book, we see the failure of paganism spelled out. And the queen, likely the the queen mother, hears about the commotion and comes in, and she recommends that Belshazzar summon Daniel to provide an interpretation. And so once again, Daniel comes in and makes sense of this revelation. And he explains that Belshazzar's offense is so great that God's judgment is on him. And he reveals the meaning of these four words, mene, mene, tekel, parson. That is, they could be taken to be decreasing weights, but taken in another way, they mean numbered, numbered, weighed, divided. And Daniel explains what that means. Belshazzar's days are numbered. He's been weighed and found wanting. And his kingdom will be divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. 
And that's precisely what happens. We don't know exactly what transpired in the fall of Babylon. The, the Persian and the Greek historians have some differing kind of details about that, so we don't know precisely. But according to Daniel, that night, Belshazzar was killed, and the Babylonian dynasty came to an end. So the central question remains, what did Belshazzar do to deserve this punishment? What was his offense? And we see the first part of it in this feast. We see that he was willing to profane God's name. While he's partying with the leaders of the kingdom, Belshazzar calls for the vessels of gold and silver that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken out of the temple in Jerusalem to be brought, and the kings and lords, his wives and his concubines might drink from them. If you recall, these were the vessels that were mentioned all the way back in chapter 1, I think verse 2 around there, where Nebuchadnezzar carried Daniel and his friends off to Babylon, and along with them, he brought these vessels from the temple, the house of God, the dwelling place of God. These were the chalices and the plates and the other instruments that were used in presenting offerings of worship to the Lord. They were sacred. They were holy. And now Belshazzar is taking those vessels, knowing full well what their intended use is, and knowing that they were designed to be used to worship God, and instead he's using them to get drunk and to worship false gods, to worship the gods of gold and silver, bronze and iron and wood and stone. This was an overt act of sacrilege. But the second offense is explained by Daniel later on in the chapter, where we discover that Belshazzar has hardened his heart against God. While Daniel's explaining this riddle, he recounts the story of Nebuchadnezzar, the story that we looked at last week. And we aren't exactly sure, you know, because of the conspiracy and all that, if uh, Belshazzar is a descendant of Nebuchadnezzar or if he's just claiming ancestry to Nebuchadnezzar to kind of bolster his credibility. Um, but either way, he's, he's claiming him as his ancestor. And so Daniel recounts the story of Nebuchadnezzar, who had been all-powerful, right? He ruled with authority. He had, that was granted to him by God, but then it went to his head. He became puffed up with pride, and God tore him down. He humbled him. And eventually Nebuchadnezzar turned in repentance and faith and looked to God and was restored. And now Daniel points out Belshazzar's offense. He says, you have not humbled your heart, though you knew all of this, but you have lifted up yourself against the Lord of heaven. Belshazzar has repeated the same offense, even though he knew Nebuchadnezzar's failure, even though he knew the error of Nebuchadnezzar's ways. He was willing to claim Nebuchadnezzar as an ancestor for political expediency, but he was unwilling to follow in Nebuchadnezzar's humility. And in fact, he doubled down on his pride and his idolatry. And Daniel says, you praised these false gods, but the God in whose hand is your breath and whose are all your ways, you have not honored. And so here we see plainly his offense. Belshazzar has chosen a path in life marked by rejection and mockery of God. And his ultimate and final act in this regard was to take what he knew to be holy, what he knew to be sacred, and to defile it, to spit in God's face as the walls were closing in. He desecrated the holy things of God because he derided the holiness of God. So here again in this chapter, we see the significance of an attribute of God in light of the abysmal failure of a man. And that attribute is the holiness of God. We see that God is holy. There is none like him. He is absolutely unique. He is unlike anything else in the universe. He stands outside of and over his creation as wholly other. He is separate from his creation. He's not contingent or dependent upon what he has made in any way, but rather exists independently and outside of all the created order. 
And as such, he's in no way bound or constrained except for internally with his own character. But he is instead exalted in splendor and majesty and in authority. After watching God supernaturally deliver his people from the hand of the Egyptians, Moses erupted in the song of praise. You remember in Exodus where he says, Who among the gods is like you, O Lord? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glory, working wonders? So God is absolutely unique. But God is also absolutely pure. If you were to take all the gems in all the world and set their brilliance against the blinding light, the blinding pure light that emanates from God, it would be as if comparing a firefly to a supernova. In his radiant light, we see not the slightest hints of defect or the most infinitesimal imperfection. He is in every way perfect, which means, as one theologian says, that he is untouched and unstained by the evil of this world. He's the supreme example of moral purity and goodness because there is no evil in him. And the characteristic of his goodness is the very source and definition of our morality. And therefore, his character serves as the standard against which all else is compared. And his purity is the metric by which all creation will be judged. In Isaiah's vision, we heard of in the call to worship here, as well as in one of the songs, his vision of the temple, the, angel, the angels are surrounding the Lord, and they declare him, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory. And how does Isaiah respond? Woe is me, for I am lost. I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. The presence of God's perfect holiness exposes Isaiah's sin his uncleanness, his unworthiness. And he cries out for mercy. And it exposes ours as well. The holiness of God should leave us speechless in awe of his majesty and simultaneously painfully aware of our need for his mercy. Paul Tripp, uh, the Christian counselor, writes in his recent book, about his uh, adventures in Dubai. He says, whenever you, you go, whenever you're going about in Dubai, you're confronted with the Burj Khalifa, the world's tallest building, everywhere you turn. Impressive skyscrapers are all around Dubai, but the Burj Khalifa looms over them all with majestic glory. At 2,716 feet, just over half a mile tall, it dwarfs buildings that would otherwise leave you in mouth-gaping awe. He says, the closer that I got to it, the more imposing and amazing the structure became. As I walked, there was no thought of the other buildings in Dubai that had previously impressed me. As amazing as those buildings were, they were simply not comparable in stunning architectural grandeur and perfection as this one. When I finally got to the base of it, I felt incredibly small, like an ant at the base of a light pole. After going up the elevator to the 125th floor, I stepped to the windows and I got a feel of how high I was and to scan the city of Dubai. And I immediately commented on how small the rest of the buildings looked. Those small buildings were skyscrapers that in any other city would have been the buildings that you wanted to visit. They looked small, unimpressive, not worthy of attention, let alone awe. I had experienced the greatest which put what had impressed me before into proper perspective. By means of God's revelation of himself in scripture, we see that there is no perfection like God's perfection. There is no holiness as holy as God's holiness. If you alone, if you allow yourself to gaze upon his holiness, you will feel incredibly small and sinful. It's a good thing spiritually to have the assessments of our own grandeur decimated by his divine glory. So again here in this chapter we are presented with a warning. 
all of us are equally unworthy to stand in the presence of a holy God. We all are sinful. Without God, every one of us has been weighed and found wanting. And we all are deserving of his judgment. You know, this is perhaps one of the most unpopular truths of the Christian faith in our culture right now, to confess that there's a holy God, that we are not him, and that there are consequences for our sin. But it is the consistent witness of the scriptures. And to reject that truth, either by ignoring the conviction of the holy God or minimizing the significance of a holy God or outright denying the truth of a holy God, is to court disaster in just the same way as Belshazzar. We must take heed of that warning that in our sinful state, we're in a state of danger. But we also see in this chapter an invitation. That is the invitation to come to the God who alone is worthy of our honor. We can choose to turn loose of these empty pursuits. We can choose to turn away from our prideful self-reliance. We can choose to turn our eyes upon God. You know, in the story of the hobbit, Bilbo Baggins and his company of dwarfs go off on a quest for treasure. Uh, and a- after all of it, after they defeat the dragon and get the treasure and all of that, they're traveling back. And they stop, and the, towards the very end of the book, they stop in Rivendell, the city of the elves. And they hear the song of the elves singing in the trees. They're singing, the stars are far brighter than gems without measure. The moon is far wider than silver and treasure. The fire is more shining than hearth in the gloaming, than gold won by mining, so why go a-roaming? Which is a great little ditty, you know, if you're trying to persuade your friends from moving away from Gainesville. Take some job, you say, why go a roaming? Look at all of the treasures of Gainesville, right? <clears throat> what are the elves saying here? The stars, the moons, the fire. The beauties of the natural world are all far superior to this hunt for man made treasure. What is a gold coin compared to the majesty of a star? And this is the point that God outshines them all. God outshines all the stars and all the celestial bodies and all the fires in all the universe. Why search for treasure in the minds of the world when the greatest treasure imaginable is found in God himself? God is worthy of our honor. He is worthy of our trust. He's worthy of our lives. And he invites us to come to him, to receive him, to know him. So we have that invitation before us today. The second and briefer reflection, you know, as we think about this God who is holy, it's important to think about what does it look like for us to live as his people in this world, to live as a holy people. You notice in this chapter that Daniel has developed a bit of a reputation in the light of the writing on the wall and the queen mother comes in and tells Belshazzar he needs to solicit the help of Daniel. Did you notice how she describes him? She said, there's a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. She took note that God was with him, that God was in him, that God was, was working in him. And that was evidenced in his life. She had observed light and understanding and wisdom, the spirit of knowledge and understanding and ability that was unlike anyone else. So even though she had a different worldview and a different religious, a different set of religious convictions, it was unmistakable, not just to her, but all the way back to Nebuchadnezzar, that there was something different about Daniel. It's helpful to remember Daniel was carried away from Judah back in 605 B.C., probably as a young teenager. We're all the way now in 539 B.C. So he is somewhere between his late 60s and his early 80s at this point. 
And as we have seen through the accounts in the story, and we're going to see in future accounts in the rest of this book, he has lived month after month, year after year, steadily walking with God. He's been trusting the Lord for his provision, worshiping God and God alone, depending on God's spirit to guide him through every twist and turn. And there were some doozies, right? He's been clinging to the truth of God. And you see the evidence of that, not only in the power of his reputation, but in the strength of his convictions. When Belshazzar offers these ornate rewards to Daniel, if, he'll, if he will give a, a, a favorable ruling, he offers him, what, a purple robe, a golden chain around his neck, uh, to be third in the kingdom, right? That would be only beneath his father and Belshazzar himself. He's extending to him symbols of status, of wealth, and of power. And how does Daniel respond? He says, let your gifts be for yourself. Let your rewards go to someone else. Daniel will not be bribed into offering a favorable ruling. He will not be swayed by the allure of wealth or status or power. He's resolute in his faith. God's people are called to be different. The Lord tells us in Leviticus, you shall be holy for I, the Lord your God, am holy. God's people are to be holy because their God is holy. And they're called to be like him. And that was true not just under the old covenant. It's true all the more in the new covenant. The apostle Peter picks up this theme. He says, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Now what most people think when they hear that word, holy, we ought to be holy, is usually one of two things. They think it means that we should be self-righteous, that is, a holy person is someone who kind of turns their nose up, looking down at others because of their, their own goodness. Or they think it means to be separatist, you know, we get like some kind of enclave and live in a bubble tucked away from the world. But a call to holiness is neither of those things. The call to holiness is not isolation from the world, but rather a devotion to God. It is to be wholly committed to him, to be set apart for him and to him, to live a life of exclusive worship to him. And a call to holiness is not a call to self-righteousness at all, far from it. It's a call to purity which is the opposite of self-righteousness. The more self-righteous we are, the more impure our heart becomes. Purity, fundamentally, is not something that we achieve. It is a gift that is given to us by God. It is something that we receive from him. We come to him with the rags of our sin, and we are robed in his righteousness. And that is what Jesus gave his life for. That's what he shed his perfect, pure blood for. That we would be cleansed, forgiven, made new, and reconciled to God. And now the call to holiness is to walk in that. To live in that newness of life. So the question to put to ourselves today is... If those outside our faith were to look at our lives, would they take note that we are different? Would they, like the Queen Mother, like Nebuchadnezzar, like a couple of generations, take note at our difference, as the Queen Mother did to Daniel? Would they see an unflinching devotion to God? Would they see that God is is your greatest treasure, that he is your deepest delight, that he is the one around whom your world revolves. 
and the one in whom you trust? Would they see a deep, heart-level purity that's marked by equal parts conviction of moral truth and a humble dependence on the Spirit of God to walk in it? Would they see someone who's kind because God has been kind to them? Would they see someone who's gracious because God has been gracious to them or compassionate or merciful? Would they see someone rooted and anchored in truth, not blown about by the cultural winds of the day, but planted firmly in the truth of God's character and his word? Would they see someone that is loyal and faithful, merciful and forgiving, courageous and joyous? Do they see the spirit of the holy God in you? That is what it looks like to be holy in our day. That is what it means. And that is what the world is dying to see. They are dying to see a church that looks like that. If we are to live with a resilient faith in this world, we have to be willing to be different. You know, I'm, I'm struck by all of the suspenseful moments that Daniel had in his life. Within the same culture, within the same lifetime, sometime, sometimes Daniel's holiness caused him to be elevated to a place of prominence and granted influence and status. And at other times it got him thrown into a den of lions. And a whole lot of times it had him stick out his neck saying something that was really unpopular with the people in power. And every single time, Daniel had no idea how that was going to turn out. He didn't know the outcome, but he was willing to remain loyal, to be holy, to be set apart in devotion to his God, to walk in purity in his life, even if it cost him his life. Now, if we are only willing to be different when we know what the outcome will be, when we know that it's safe, when we know that it's acceptable within our society, and that are, that's the limit to which we will be different, then I suggest to you we're not being motivated by the holiness of God. We're being motivated by our own comfort. If we are to truly endure as a witness to the truth and the goodness of God in our world, we must be willing to stand out, to be different, even to be cut down, because we are standing up for the holiness of God. But if we are willing, God wishes to fill you so much with his presence that the symbols of value offered by this world will have no allure. And you, along with Daniel, can say to the world, keep your rewards for yourself. I have the reward of a true king who offers the greatest gift imaginable, himself.